Patrick White was born a Londoner in Knightsbridge in May 1912. Although resident in Sydney by the time he was six months old, by the age of 27, when he published his first and well-received novel, he would have lived nearly half of his life in England. By 1939, the author of Happy Valley had been a boarder of a New South Wales Highland school, had been transported with all its associated imagery to an English boarding school, had jackarooed on family farms in New South Wales, had read German and French at Cambridge, had toured Europe and Scandinavia with his parents, travelled to New York to seek an agent, rushed to completion the disappeared second novel, The Living and the Dead, and was back in his bedsit in time for the London Blitz. His war years were spent largely in Northern Africa, dodging snipers, reading Dickens during interminable stays of activity, and as an RAF intelligence officer, rifling the pockets of enemy corpses on desert battlefields. It was, it was there, not on the battlefields, but in, but in Egypt, in 1941, that White would meet his life's love, Manoli Lascaris. By the time White returned to Australia with Manoli in 1947, he'd completed the play A Ham Funeral, which the Maidment Theatre in London had declined to produce for its want of decency, and surely his first masterpiece, The Arts Story, which was celebrated in New York, but tepidly, if not scornfully, received in the UK and Australia. By 1948, the Greek and the Londoner were breeding dogs and farming their property, Castle Hill, outside Sydney, where it seemed white, brooding and dejected, had considered never writing again. This, of course, is not how it turned out. Though they farmed Castle Hill for another 16 years, by 1955, there was the tree of man, for there had been an epiphany, and there was always ambition, and then there was the artist's contract, my flawed self, he would write, has only ever felt intensely alive in the fiction I create. By 1964, White had published Voss and Riders in the Chariot. And by 1962, the well, no, we, we corrected this. David actually corrected this for me. Um, he'd published Season at Sarsaparilla in, in 1962, A Cheery Soul in 1963, and Night on Bald Mountain in 1964. Um, here in Lens my, ends my bibliography, although clearly not Patrick White's. Up to his death in 1990, White wrote a further six novels, five plays, a memoir, a screenplay, and numerous short fiction. He became a social advocate, speaking out against nuclear war, grasping developers, institutional corruption, and advocating for indigenous rights and conservation. He was not, by his own admission, a political being. You are either born one, he declared, or you are not. But as he increasingly integrated with the artistic and social activism of the 70s, having sold the farm and moved with Bonoli closer to the centre of Sydney Bohemia and politics, he found he was compelled, if by nature an unlikely, public spokesperson for the left. And receiving a Nobel Prize for Literature in 1973, as Bonoli predicted on the morning of the media scrum outside their home in Martin Road, changed things forever. While undoubtedly recognised as an iconic Australian, his relationship to Australia and the Australian public's readership and their relationship to his art has hardly been clear cut. He knew however many, however many books he sold, they often went unread. He professed never to read them himself once they'd gone to print, but he would check in the public library for dog ears and fingerprint marks and see how far in the book they travelled, noting, sadly, that they often ceased before the end. In an unforgettable passage in his 1958 essay, The Prodigal Son, in answer to the question why he remained resident in Australia when so many artists had fled, White wrote, in all directions stretched the great Australian emptiness in which the mind is the least of possessions, in which the rich man is the important man, in which the schoolmaster and the journalist rule what intellectual roost there is, in which beautiful youths and girls stare at life through blind blue eyes, in which teeth fall like autumn leaves, the buttocks of cars grow hourly glassier, food means steak and cake, muscles prevail, and the march of material ugliness does not raise a quiver from the average nerves. Nothing's changed. 
It was the exaltation of the average that made me panic. White chose to face off what he felt was the dreary, ugly and monotonous life of 50s Australia through insisting there must be a poetry hidden in, in it which gave it purpose. Speaking of the Parkers in the Tree of Man, he wrote, I wanted to discover the extraordinary behind the ordinary, the mystery and the poetry which alone could make bearable the lives of such people and, incidentally, my own since my return. What repeatedly dramatises the poetry in White's work is the landscape, the elemental, and the suburban, the rambunctious minutiae of ordinary life, and of course, satire. In White's plays, those often hilarious vaudevillian worlds of fun poking at respectability, at small souls in epic battles with heightened desires, that Australian emptiness beats with shattered hearts. However, char however characters may appear dressed as stereotypes, White cares for them inordinately. To paraphrase Neil Armfield, in his character's battles between the spirit and the body, the good and the evil, their search is for humility. As the dangerous Roy says in the season at Sarsaparilla, you can't shed your own skin, no matter how much it itches. White believed we are a pragmatic nation, one which tends to confuse reality with surface. The question remains, in our inner selves, is reality anything more than surface? Whether insight and illumination is possible, or whether transcendence can find us in the company of others. In the epigraph to part three of the aunt's story, White quotes Olive Schreiner, when your life is most real, to me you are mad. I wouldn't call myself a humanist, White wrote. I'm indifferent to people in general but I have always been gregarious. This myth that I am not has been put about by bitches I wouldn't have in my house. <laughs> I like people, but I like to choose my people. In the Nobel citation, White is credited with, credited with an epic and psychological narrative which has introduced a new continent into literature. Perhaps that continent was no less being introduced to itself. Um, Gary and David, Mark, um, as intimates of Patrick White, I thought you might do us the favour of, of conjuring him, um, at least perhaps his character, his personality, um, through a personal experience or observation. You knew him first. Um, my introduction to Patrick was, I'd been out of drama school a couple of years, but I'd sort of been, I'd disappeared into the boondocks for a couple of years doing theatre and education. And I went back to Sydney and I'd done a couple of plays and I was called in to do a screen test for um, The Night the Prowler, which was adapted from Patrick's short story. And Jim Sharman was, um, th was the director. So I did a screen test. And what happens is that usually, you know, you do a screen test and then they ring up and say, yes, you've got the job, or if you don't have the job, you never hear from them again. So about a week later, my agent rang and said, um, Jim Sharman wants to have lunch with you. And I thought, okay, well, I might be in with a chance if he wants to meet me, because I'd met him very briefly at the screen test. So Jim took me out to lunch, and Jim is not a relaxing person to be with. He's very intense, and I was, I'd never done a film before, and never even had any film training at NIDA, you know. And uh, so he said, um, and he, what do you think of the script? And I said, well, I've got a couple of problems with it, but, you know, they could easily be fixed. I just don't think that scene is works there and you know because he was asking my opinion because it was the central role and so then he said and now we're going to meet Patrick White and I thought oh no I'm terrified I can't bear it and so Patrick was at a very um, social restaurant called Le, Le Cafe in, in Paddington with a bunch of theatrical luminaries now I was completely and totally unknown and um, I walked into the walked into the restaurant, and Patrick leapt to his feet. And I mean, at this stage, I didn't even know I had the job. And he leapt to his feet and said, "I'd like you to meet the star of my new film, Kerry Walker." And they all turned and stared at me, and I wanted to just shrink into the ground. It was just absolutely appalling. And so. I sort of you know, sat down and they said, well, come and sit next to Patrick. You must sit next to Patrick. So I sat next to him 
and the waiter came and said, would you like a glass of wine? And I said, yes, I'd love a glass of wine. <laughs> so I reached for the glass of wine and in, managed to knock over his glass of wine into his lap. <laughs> and then I found myself grabbing a white napkin from the table and I started to dabble in his crutch. You know? <laughs> and I was, this was my introduction. Well, the character I was playing was a, a lumpy girl called Felicity and um, Patrick was absolutely thrilled because you know, I could not have been more Felicity <laughs> than this. <laughs> and from that moment we became... Um, oh, it, it, we became friends, but it was um, he was so gorgeous to me over the 13 years that I knew him. And um, I could not have asked for a more loving, supportive and um, fabulous friend. Oh, Kerry, oh, you were the also the bad times. Well, you know, he gave me the rounds of the kitchen when I had a lover of whom he didn't approve and we didn't speak for six weeks, but... <laughs> Every day we were each on the phone to our mutual friends telling our mutual friends how absolutely furious we were with the other one and eventually we kissed and made up. And Carrie, in the New South Wales archives there are 20 opening night cards that Patrick White sent to you. There's also a recipe for something called Nivik. But the thing that really caught my eye was a recipe for a Hungarian dish called hangover soup. Hangover soup, that's right, yes, because he, he wanted, you know, because he, he said that he always had hangovers and this was very, very good for, very good for, um, for hangovers and so he recommended it. I can't even remember what it was in because I didn't, I didn't ever make it. It was sort of, a, it was revolting. What, I, mean, I made it once and it was, Africa. and it was horrible. <laughs> anyway. But he was a very good cook, but that, not on that one. I'm David. I was in my late 30s and I had this insane idea that I would write a biography of Patrick White. I couldn't work out why one hadn't been written. Um, and I had written a biography of the Chief Justice, um, Sir Garfield Barwick, um, the idea being that my biography was going to more or less sort of send him to the stake and get him burnt alive, which hadn't quite worked. But um, the experience of writing that biography had been extremely difficult because Barwick um, saw me once, lied that he had never seen me, and set about ordering his friends not to talk to me. And it had made the years of writing that biography extraordinarily difficult. Um, and I wrote to White uh, saying, well, well, I'm going to write your biography, and suggesting we have a truce that, um, that he let me get on with it without actually ordering his friends not to talk to me. I thought that that was the best that I could expect from a man with such a frightening reputation. Um, and, and then the phone rang. Hello, <laughs> Patrick White here. Can you come around on Tuesday? And I said, yes, I could. And I was just shaking and sort of that was a very, very brief conversation. And I thought, okay, I'm going to go around, I'm going to be grilled and maybe we'll be able to work out what this is. And I turned up at his house, Manoli opened the door, later told me that he'd been very impressed because my shoes were well polished, polished not only at the front, but at the back, which he liked. <laughs> but I was, and Patrick was sitting there and there was, there were no preliminaries. He said, what do you want to ask me? And what I had to learn from that point, apart from the fact that he had made the decision that this project would go ahead, um, of his total professionalism as a writer, knowing what the project I had undertaken required and making sure over the next seven years that it happened. And my first meeting with him was not so much as a formidable personality but as a formidable professional writer. Mm. Um, David, which segues into my next question, which really, um, your description of delivering your manuscript to Patrick White is unforgettable. Um, any <coughs> actor that wants to drop some dread um, into their performance would only need to remember um, what you wrote. Would you like to share with the audience that experience? It's a slightly complicated story. Um, Patrick had, as a great friend, um, a gossip, now dead, who was married to a Sydney judge. And this judge was furious with me because I had described a great uncle of his in my Barwick biography as a drunk. Um, and um, this man 
got into Patrick's ear and told Patrick that I couldn't be trusted, that I wasn't to be allowed anywhere near this biography, that he had to break off with me because I'd called his great uncle a drunk. Now, this man had never met his great uncle, and I had spoken to people who worked with his great uncle. His great uncle was, as it happens, a drunk. Um, <laughs> but the judge was much, would much have preferred if I had described his uncle as a womanizer to explain the long absences from his practice, which allowed a little man, a, a very, very young man, 19 or 20 year old Garfield Barwick, to take over a large solicitor's practice because the man was actually a drunk and a woman. Anyway, the thing was that this, this occurred about a year into the working with Patrick and it was a complete hiatus and I had to go around and sit with Patrick. Patrick had no intention of stopping what was gonna happen, but at that point we worked out the deal between us. And again, an absolutely professional and brave deal, which was he would read the manuscript after it had been delivered to the publishers. He would have no veto over the manuscript and he would give me all the copyright permissions I needed to quote from his work. That was a given. But that once the manuscript was delivered, he would have a chance to read it and comment on what he saw as any inaccuracies in the manuscript. And I thought that that was remarkable, Ooh. a really remarkable arrangement. Um, and, but it did mean that at the end of the day, whatever the arrangement, one of the great masters of English prose was going to read my poor effort at describing his life, which meant, I think, that it, I spent at least a year longer on the job, <laughs> polishing and madly polishing, with Patrick on the phone, very grumpy, when are you gonna finish that fucking book? Because he was very, he, was, he did not wish to die before he read the manuscript, nor did I wish him to die before he read the manuscript. Anyway, the time eventually came, and I dropped off the manuscript and to the publishers in North Sydney, and then I drove over to Centennial Park, and I had had this very fat, very fat, a manuscript bound into three volumes. And I gave them to him and he said to me, you know, no, that's right. He first, he read the first paragraph, which is a description of his mother. And he looked up and he said, you wouldn't want to have that said about you. And then he said to me, the most wonderful thing, he said, you know, I don't care what people think. And that was that, nothing more was said. I ran away at that point. I went um, to, I think I went to Cape York, as far away as I could possibly get. And then I came back to Sydney and waited and it was Kerry who rang and said he's read it. That was fine. Um, and then he rang and he said certain things which are just private between us. And then he said, but, We've work to do. And I said, oh, and he said, yes, yes, there's work to do. I want you to come around. And so I, w I, I went around there and he had set up a table. And on one side he had the manuscript and there was a space for me to sit on the other side with the manu copy of the manuscript that I had brought. And he'd said, yes, we need to read it. And I, and I sat down and I said, so, so Patrick, are there some problems? I said, oh no, let's just read it. And he started at the first page. <laughs> and then I thought, oh, well, maybe there's something on the first page. And then he turned the page and I thought, well, maybe there's a problem on page two. And he read page two and turned it. And then I realized that he was reading it in front of me. He was going to read the whole fucking book in front of me. And that's what he did over nine days. It took nine half days with him grumbling and moaning <laughs> and protesting, correcting a few things here and there. I nearly died. I nearly, nearly, nearly died. I'd worked for seven years on this and this is what he was doing. And then I realized that this was the most astonishing opportunity and I noted down every remark he said. I was reading it again in front of him. I was seeing stylistic difficulties. I was making changes. I was asking him questions. I got some final, extremely important confessions out of him during that session. And also in all of that time, he would laugh uproariously, but it was never at anything I had written. It was <laughs> always, it was always stuff from his own letters. These letters, 
these letters which he had told everybody had to be destroyed and he was reading them again for the first time and these were letters, some of them which went back over 50 years and he loved them <laughs> and he was roaring with laughter um, at them. But he made me, he tortured me for nine days. And, and so, David, the, um, the difference between the letters which you edited is, of course, that he was, he was deceased by then. So what responsibilities or protocols or, what, or did you miss the fact that you didn't have him to actually go through that process with? Um, well, the accuracy of the text didn't matter then because the texts were his letters and my footnotes, of course. The accuracy, accuracy of them mattered. Um, uh, but it was a very different process because, we, you know, I'd, I'd been through Hellfire Pass with the biography and then I knew the letters intimately and the letters were, the problem with the letters was, was bringing down, a, you could have had two volumes, two fat volumes of letters and it was the problem with the letters was bringing them down. But there was also this strange sense of, of Patrick White by this time dead um, and therefore you were on your own. Mm. And it was, at sometimes, it, at, at times it felt a little bit like um, kind of owning the material in a very inappropriate way. But you just had to keep reminding, you're on your own now. Um, you've got to remember what he taught you, remember what you know, and work on that. Um, but, but it, and it was a very, very different process. One of the things that um, in during that nine days that you have to remember that he was so old and so sick, he could scarcely breathe, he was coughing, I mean, his bones had crumbled, he was in constant pain because you know, he had three vertebrae and his back had kind of just collapsed. And this, this, the strength of will that he had um, you know, to sit there for nine days was just extraordinary. Professionalism in a way, but he was punishing me. I mean, this was, yeah. it was the most spectacular punishment yeah. devisable. Um, and he finished the process and he died a few weeks later. Mm. So it was, it, was, um, it, was his last, it was his last work in a way. It was his monumental effort. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, David Mus Musgrave, I noticed a few incidental synchronicities when I was kind of looking you up, um, that both you and Patrick White claimed that you would have been cooks if you weren't writers, <laughs> that you both published very significant works on April Fool's Day, which I think is game. Yeah. Um, oh, that was my publisher's His idea. being his self-portrait and yours being uh, your novel Glissander. Um, and you both describe in almost identical phrases uh, the movement from first draft of a work to second draft of a work um, as being the movement from fictional implausibility to fictional plausibility. Um, what seems less of an accident is that your current novel, Glissanda, is literally haunted, if not peopled, populated um, by characters from the novel Voss. Um, so I wanted to ask you to tell us why. Um, what does it mean to do it? And what kind, is it an homage or is it something else? It's really a parody, but uh, parody meant in the nicest possible way, that it's, <laughs> it's actually a really deep compliment to a book uh, that I love by an author that I love. Um, it it's, was written so long ago now that I find, I find it difficult to remember why I chose Voss. But I, I think it was because I was teaching at Sydney University and I had to teach the book and I, had, I was sort of... Uh, <laughs> I was rereading it and wondering, what the hell am I going to say? And I just talked to a friend of mine about it, and he said, well, it's ridiculous. It's camp. It's, it's phantasmagoric. And then I realised that that suddenly opened up a whole way of looking at the work as being... Uh, I don't want to demean it by saying silly, but there's a silliness there, a very deeply serious silliness. And that's what engaged me. My um, intellectual, my scholarly work was, was also concerned with satire, with, with Manipian satire, which is this particular form. When I finished my doctorate, I pretty much started writing the book straight away. And I'd, in the meantime, I'd re-read re Voss about six or seven times. And it just, it probably started with one idea, which is something I can explain intuitively, but not logically, which is that parodies precede the works they parody. And so I set about writing the work which Patrick White would have had to have parody 
in order to write poems. <laughs> so that's that's the that's the the genesis of the idea. No wonder you write about Beckett as well. <laughs> oh, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so, but but tell, tell us about the style. I mean, yours is a very rambunctious novel. It's very enjoyable, where the most important thing in the world is theatre and theatre criticism, which yeah. made me laugh a lot. Um, uh, not that it's not, Carrie, but it's rarely acknowledged as that in the, the bigger wide world. Um, but the, ca the characters, are, um, the idea of there being two brothers, which also then takes us back to the solid Mandala. And, mm. and also my brother. Um, yeah, I think... There was, a, there, there was a complicated genesis there. I had, of all the characters in Voss, the one character that couldn't be parodied in a way or couldn't be included without unbalancing Glissando was Laura Trevelyan because it, she's, she's an anchor. She's a very, very serious anchor in that book. And, and, and in, in a sense, everyone else circling around her is ridiculous. But she, she has this very serious moral purpose. So that, even Voss himself isn't... There's a kind of a... a an excess to his seriousness, which, which I think tilts over into um, camp or, or ridiculousness. So in, in a way, it was wondering what those, what the, how those characters could have been that in, in a way in this book that Patrick White then would have, would have read and then decided, no, they can't be like that, they have to be like this. So in a sense, the characters are a bit flatter in a way mm. than, than they are in, in Voss. But um, uh, there's uh, two distinct voices um, in this book. One is the voice of the, the narrator, Archibald Fleece. And uh, in a way, I had a lot of freedom there because, you know, of the novels, only uh, Memoirs of Many and One is in the first person. So there's a, there's a, um, a great degree of latitude I had to create him as an interesting character. And his style was very, uh, a bit lugubrious, a bit sort of pompous, a bit self-regarding, self, um, um, self-obsessed. But then the other voice was his grandfather's voice, and that's, that was actually imagining, well, how would, how would Voss have spoken if he was uh, th this anterior parodic character? And I had a lot of fun with his voice. That, and that, that, was, that became a very distinct style, and that was, that was fun to write. Um, are you going to, what are you going to do next? Is oh. there another Patrick White novel coming? <laughs> no, it's about to be. No, no, no. It's a, the ne next. It's populated. No, next is a, it's a novel about the collision of um, uh, Fan de Sekla, 20th century band, inner city band culture with a family life and sort of held together by someone who collects obituaries. That's, cool. Yeah. Um, what, you've written about the Ern Malley affair, and one of the things that, that um, we were discussing backstage um, was the fact that in 2006, chapter two or three, I think it was, of Eye of the Storm was sent to a whole bunch of publishers and agents. Um, and uh, I think the author's name was an anagram of Patrick White, it was Wraith Pickett. Um, and no one picked it up as in no one offered to publish it. Um, and those that actually identified the, um, the, the, the potential brilliance of language um, said it was, but it was an absolute mess. It would need the kind of editing that no publisher could afford. So sorry, this person had better just get out and do it on their own. Um, what, what kind of, what does it make you feel? Um, that well, one, the nature of the hoax, is it fair? Two, does it matter if it's fair? Um, and three, someone uh, who is such a remarkable stylist as Patrick White not being identified as such, and that it being a problem, that it has to be fixed, we have to fix this literature. I, I think it was a very fair hoax, and I think it was very revealing. Um, I mean, this book uh, took 12 years to be published, and it was really only through generosity or the vision of, of an independent publisher, Sleepers, based here in Melbourne, um, uh, it doesn't surprise me in the least. David, what do you think? Just on Earn Malley for a moment, I think um, Patrick White was, of course, for many, many, many years before their relationship soured completely, an ally, a friend, a supporter, a spruker for Sid Nolan. Mm. And, of course, Nolan was one of the victims of Earn Malley because Nolan had illustrated the cover of the famous Earn Malley edition of um, Angry Penguins. And you, I've, I've never seen a reference in anything of Patrick's to the Earn Malley hoax. He just, he just, you know, he just didn't want to have anything, never went near it. I think the, the, the sending around of the chapter is interesting. I mean, my, the publishers that I've 
most published with, um, Allen and Unwin. And they are very, very pleased with the fact that they had sent it to another reader and had not replied to the supposed author, had not rejected it, had not commented on it <laughs> in sad. any way before the hoax was revealed. So Alan and Unwin come, come out of it really well. The other thing is this, frankly, that, that material that was sent around is by no means Patrick White at the height of his powers. I think that's pretty dud. Pretty, I mean, I, I'm not somebody who says that every word Patrick White wrote is work of genius. I think that those chapters of The Eye of the Storm are pretty flimsy myself. Um, and they also, um, it was chapters, it was chapter three, three it was wasn't three. it? it well, it you know, if it had been, if it had been chapter one, two and four, you know, it's, it's, it's a delicious thing if you're going to do a hoax of that kind to send something out of narrative sequence so that it not only drops from a stranger but has no sort of feet to it either. But it's not the greatest Patrick White. It's also a clear mark that fashion in writing had moved on. And there's no sense in us, in no sense in us denying this. Um, in many ways, Patrick White's writing in those years, and The Eye of the Storm is a novel from the early 70s, I think, um, those were the years of some of his most mannered writing, and it was before he'd returned to the theatre very, well, he'd had one go in the theatre, but he was about to come back to the theatre very strongly. It's very, very mannered writing, and the taste for that kind of writing um, had all but, has now all but disappeared. I mean, it hasn't entirely by any means. Annie Proulx, who is on a tour of Australia, or about to be on a tour of Australia, is a great fan of Patrick White's writing. And when you know that, and when you think of um, shipping news, you can see, the, you can hear the voice of Patrick White in the shipping news. Annie Proulx was very, very sweetly and flatteringly asked if she could write um, a cover note for the American edition of the letters, and she did. Um, she remains a great fan of White's writing. She thinks Patrick White's one of the greatest writers of the 20th century. And those of us who've read and admired Cormac McCarthy, mm -hmm. Cormac McCarthy is the voice, it's the same voice that wrote Voss. You know, those sort of um, extraordinarily baroque descriptions of crossing harsh landscape. I mean, Cormac McCarthy could be up before Media Watch for some of the <laughs> sheer <laughs> plagiarism by spirit. But, but that, the taste for that style of writing has greatly diminished, greatly diminished. It's gone. And that's also one of the reasons why that hoax worked. And so in terms of White's legacy as a, a writer to other writers, where has it moved to where the, where the legacy remains, but in fact it's so fundamentally shifted into another world that it, that it remains, I suppose, to taste, to contemporary taste? Oh, well, no, I don't think it's close to contemporary taste at all, because the shift from the eye of the storm to what I think is is I actually think is his masterpiece, which is The Twyborn Affair, mm. which he wrote as an old man, um, where the clarity of the writing is astonishing. It is still, of course, um, it's, it's still pretty Baroque and it's, and it's very, very heavily written, um, but, but um, it is a great novel. And you don't need any introductions or primers. You don't need to immerse yourself in the thinking of another age to walk right into The Twyborn Affair. And I also think that's true of, of others, others of his novels, and they will survive on their own terms um, as, as, you know, you can enter them. You don't need introductions to his work. Read the books. Um, um, and and if, you, if you find yourself in a landscape that welcomes you, stay there. But, but it's not closed. It's not written in another language. We're not asking people to learn German or something. This is, this is magnificent English prose. Um, Kerry, can I read to you something that you said on the radio? and which is just so exquisite and spot on. And I'd like it to be an introduction to talking about some of the theatre writing. Um, Kerry says, beauty and ugliness, moments of shame, moments of grace. These things are around us all the time, but it takes an artist to force us to see them. Without artists like Patrick White, life easily becomes gray. He's someone who makes us see the technicolor in the everyday. He achieves writing's minor miracle, using nothing but words, he shakes us awake. 
which I think is marvellously written, Kerry. Um, I said that 20 years ago on radio. I had no recollection of saying it until Stephen actually found it today and told it to me. So, um, but yes, I, uh, it's, I think that I still have my, my opinion hasn't changed. Um, when people say, if I'd had a dollar for every time somebody had approached me rather aggressively and said, I read 10 pages of Voss, didn't understand a word of it, I threw it away, what's that all about? And I'd say, well, um, um, you should try finishing the book before you actually know what, um, before you, you, are, you want to know what it's all about. No, but anyway. Um, and I was thinking with the plays, we did a production of a, of a play which he wrote specifically for this group of 13 actors in Adelaide in 1983 called Netherwood. And it was Patrick's response to the threat of nuclear holocaust, among other things. And because of the, the timing of the school holidays, we were, um, we were asked to do a school's matinee very soon after we'd, we'd opened. And we were all working, you know, we were back to backing. We were rehearsing one play in the daytime and performing another at night. And we felt that the management had slightly got this wrong because the, the material was, was dense. It was, um, it was a lot of sexual references. And you think Adelaide school kids, you know, high school kids, 16, you know, putting this and we were, they were going to be hooting and throwing things and shouting. Well, how wrong we were. Um, they listened with such, they laughed in all the right places. They listened with such incredible attentiveness. Um, they were moved by it. And at the end, the quality and the caliber of the incisiveness of the questions that they asked. And we thought, my gosh, you know, how wrong. We had totally underestimated those kids. We, were, we had basically, as a group of adults, patronized them by thinking that they couldn't get it, but also seriously underestimating Patrick's ability just to speak to people. And I mean, I'm sure there were kids in that audience that didn't get it, but I would say that probably 90% of them did. And I thought, you know, the plays, are not difficult if you go in not expecting a linear progression. I mean, Patrick was a modern, you know, and for people who uh, have only seen naturalism in the theatre, and many people only uh, ha have, um, because he, he was an expressionist writer, um, people are, are concerned by it. But if you just go in with an open mind, in the same way as that you go into an art gallery and 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 look at a look at a painting. Um, that's what I, and it, that was, it was such a salutary experience, that school's matinee of, of Netherwood. It, it seemed to me that um, when I was researching just Patrick White generally, the reception to his work was often qualified um, by institutional, either publishers, reviewers, um, the intermediaries between us and, and the artists, um, constantly um, saying reader beware, you know, qualifying their, however enthusiastic they were, that it couldn't possibly be successful, um, that the Twyburn affair was not for the squeamish. I thought that was an extraordinary thing to say. The, the night the Prowler, when it was first screened in 1978, 1979, I think. Yeah. 79? 78, that's right, yeah. Um, was, was sort of screen tested in midnight screenings in, in downbeat cinemas because they needed to check that it was going to be okay. Did we aware of that? Mm. It's, on the, um, the, oh, it's on the film archive kind of website. This constant kind of standing between us and our own um, discernment, our own taste. In fact, well, our, our own capacity to actually engage. But that says, that says um, at least as much about Australia at that time mm. um, as it does about white. And because White was a huge figure in Australian literature, um, there was a lot of effort to try to corral him by those moral, the moral forces who wanted to keep, who wanted to keep literature polite in this country. It's, it was a, literature was like film and other things as well, a battleground. Uplifting. Uh, for respectability and for decency and, and that kind of thing. Now what these idiots who are with us still, what these idiots didn't realize about White is that he was the most, the most powerful spruker for morality 
that anybody was going to read in an Australian work. I mean, this is the thing about White. What makes him extraordinary and makes him for many people uncongenial is that his work is not about finding happiness in the usual ways that are celebrated in literature. You don't find happiness in Patrick White's works through sexual fulfillment. You do not fall in love. The conclusion, well, you can fall in love, but the conclusion of one of White's novels is never that the lovers get together. That fundamental pattern of, an, of, of, of a novel is not White's. His novels and his work in theatre is warning people against easy pleasure. It's warning them against the pleasures of drink and food and sex and laziness and relaxation. It's warning them against the dangers of living in this country. <laughs> uh, and it is telling people that the point of living is to work and to and to work with what God has given you as your talents. And the greatest failures in his work and the greatest, um, f the people he fucked off in his life, viciously at times, were all the people he believed had failed their own talent and had not lived up to the promise that was, that was in them at birth. And here were these petty little would-be moral tyrants whinging about this man whose greatest message about this country in the end was that we are an unprincipled people. And that's, for me, why White remains a, a strong force in this country. I would wish him to be a stronger force in this country. Um, and a voice that still speaks here. We are an unprincipled country. So it's time we found our principles. Tell us about um, his identification as a Londoner. It was the very first thing he said when he was awarded the Nobel Prize, um, when he was asked about being an Australian. Actually, he said, well, actually, I'm a Londoner. Um, <laughs> and uh, David recently gave a lecture, um, the Menzies lecture, where you explore this theme um, in Patrick White, and there are a number of things that came out of it that I thought were absolutely fascinating. Would you like to just briefly survey well, in, could, in a couple of minutes? Well, I could first say that it's a bloody difficult assignment bringing Patrick White and Robert Menzies together <laughs> into, a coherent, into a coherent lecture. And, and I just uh, thank God I remembered that Menzies was present when White won the Miles Franklin Award for Voss, which was the first award of the Miles Franklin, and gave this completely ridiculous speech praising Patrick White, um, clearly not having read the book, because it said something like, you know, it's, it's marvellous that Australian literature is finally concentrating more on character than landscape. And you think, oh, you, know, you, have, you have not read this book. No. Um, and um, it was at a time when White still voted, voted for Menzies. Uh, and really, that was you know about it for the connection between the two. But um, but what they also had in common was that they both adored um, England, but in completely different ways. Menzies adored England for its for its Englishness, for the monarchy. For the, he wept when he saw the White Cliffs of Dover for the first time when he was in his forties. He was in his 40s before he saw England for the first time. Whereas White had been born there, he'd gone to university there, as Stephen said, he'd gone to school there, and when it came to being a writer, he, he, the place he wanted to do that was in London, and what he wanted to be at that time was to be the next great West End playwright. And he lived in London for long stretches, and he was the kind of, Patrick, to the end of his days, was the kind of person who adored London by whinging about it ceaselessly. Um, like, you know, you, could, you can show your love of this city by ceaselessly moaning about Melbourne, but it's actually love that you're expressing. Um, we're familiar with it in Sydney as well. Um, but London was enormously important to him. And when you go through the novels, he wrote his first Happy Valley in London, um, he wrote the second one, partly in London, partly in New York, about London. Voss, the idea for Voss came to him during the Blitz as he was 
upending a bottle of Calvados into his gullet as the bombs were coming down and reading the journals of, of air um, and being, being um, suddenly thinking, I've got to write a, a novel about an explorer. Um, the, uh, the, the, the idea of the aunt story was all conceived in London. Um, and thereafter, when he it was a long hiatus when he, you know, he went to Australia. You know, he saw that that land of emptiness that he saw as Australia then, while all of those other artists were fleeing to New York and fleeing to London. He came back, and that was the point. He could say all of those terrible things about this country because he came back to write about it. And that was the bravest thing he ever did in his life. So while he claimed to be a Londoner at heart, and in many, many ways he was, he was an artist. And this is where he knew he had to be as an artist. And, but he never wanted anybody to own him. And so in 1973, when he won the Nobel Prize, which pleased him enormously, um, do not believe any other um, but pleased him enormously. Uh, the, the interviews he gave immediately after winning the Nobel Prize, he asserted his independence by saying, you don't own me. I'm a funny kind of Australian. I'm actually a Londoner at heart. And, and he believed that, and in part it was, and in, and it was sort of true. Um, but London was essential, certainly later in life, to his to publishing. He'd always had a great New York publisher. He finally found a great London publisher. And in those days, you had to be, for his kind of writer, published first in either New York or London. Um, and London was where he found such wonderful stories. The gossip from London was just simply the best gossip in the world. And the, the meeting with Roy de Meister. And, and, and in London, he had discovered um, an Australian, um, Roy de Mester, um, a painter. And it was Roy who ha was this, this strange man who went quite bananas towards the end of his life and concocted a close royal connection and became a Catholic and painted a rather good Stations of the Cross, which hangs in Westminster Cathedral, um, and did some terrific religious painting, actually. But Roy plucked up young men and made them see the possibilities of their own talent. And before he plucked up young Patrick White and said, look, mate, you're not really the next Goldsworthy. You're actually a novelist and get on with it and take your inspiration from Australia. He'd taken this furniture designer, Francis Bacon, and said, look, you're not really a furniture designer. I think you might be a painter. And that was a great gift that Demester had of finding this talent. It was all mixed up with all kinds of sexual mentoring as well, um, but it was very, it was crucial for White. And the, of course, to have been in London when the Blitz began was, in, in imaginative terms, one of the fundamental experiences of White's life. And the Blitz and the rain of fire from the sky is an image that recurs throughout his work from the time, um, from the time he himself was caught in the Blitz. And, um, and finally, it's there at the, in the finale of the Twyborn affair. And Eddie Twyborn, having not taken off his makeup, but, ha but having taken off his frock, at least, and put on a pair of pants, is crossing London to be reunited with his mother and is killed in the Blitz. And the, and the, the fire from the sky is a fundamental image of White's, all from London. And the punchline of your lecture which I really did enjoy, um, if you believe that Sir Robert needed to be redeemed at all, <laughs> um, is that he did not. He advised the, um, the, the, the Liberal Party not to block supply in 1975. I was desperately searching for one more thing they had in common. And, that, uh, and the opinion that supply should not have been blocked in 1975 was, That's yes, was, a, was a desperate attempt to find something at the end.